All right, students, today we're going to be doing a little recap on the topic, which is semiconductors. All right. Now, you know, as we go through, we're going to be identifying these components, these devices rather, as we go through. So what are these devices? You know, you're going to come to appreciate that all these devices are semiconductor devices. So this is a MOSFET, this is a transistor, this is a transistor BJD, and you know these are diodes, so these are light emitting diodes. Um, this is one of your regular diodes. You have a Zener diode, you also have you know Shockley and so forth. You know, those, all these are examples of semiconductor materials. Now, what are semiconductors? Now, when we deal with our election theory or theory of electrons, you remember on the outermost shell, we refer to it as a valence shell. The outermost shell is referred to as a valence shell. Now, when we have just, you know, three or less electrons on the outermost shell, then that is referred to as a conductor. When we have more than four, then it is referred to as an insulator. But when we just have four electrons on this outer shell, then we get the term semiconductor. It is a semiconductor. So therefore, it is not a full conductor and it is not a full insulator of electricity. So that is what a semiconductor is. It has only four electrons on the outermost shell. So its resistance is midway between that of a conductor and that of an insulator. Now, as we carry on, we just want to create what is called you know, a web map. Now, these are terminologies that we're going to be using. For example, we have what is called a crystal lattice structure. A crystal lattice structure. We're going to be using terminologies such as covalent bonds. We're going to be using terminologies such as intrinsic intrinsic semiconductor then we're going to get the term extrinsic semiconductor you're going to be hearing about doping you're going to be hearing about impurities you're going to be hearing about you know majority carriers and also minority carriers you're also going to be hearing about you know donor and also acceptor and this is just to name a few all right so let us see if we can carry on now the first thing that we're going to be talking about is what is referred to as a crystal lattice structure so the crystal lattice structure that is the first thing that we're going to be you know talking about the crystal lattice structure now in semiconductors the atoms are arranged in what is called crystal lattice structure which the atoms occupy sites on the nodes of the lattice so if we think about it right here we have what is called a plus 4e so this is the element plus 4e and uh, if we just should just do a little crystal lattice structure then you know this would be another plus 4e and uh, you know this is where we get the terminology covalent bonds from because you know we are going to appreciate how you know an atom plus 4e an element rather is able to covalent bond now covalent bond is simply the process of you know an element sharing the electrons with a neighboring element so if you think about this one for example this particular one right here in the center then it is a semiconductor so it will have four electrons on its outer shell four electrons on its outer shell one two three four but how does it how is it able to con, um, complete you know its structure well this 
element right here will also have four. So it will be sharing this one. So this one will be shared with this element, while this is also being shared with this element. Following? So they're going to be sharing. Now this will be sharing one of its electrons. Certainly the semiconductor that will be here plus four E will also be sharing. The semiconductor here will also be sharing. Now around the semiconductor, you notice it will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it will have eight electrons on its outer shell. So as a result, you know that shell is complete. But in truth and in fact, what happened here is what is referred to as covalent bonding. Covalent bonding. Because it is sharing, you know, the electrons on its outermost shell with a neighboring um, atomic structure. So that is what covalent bonding is referred to. Now, the, the, a semiconductor doing this, you know, it will, it will not be able to, it's not workable. It's not workable because this semiconductor, it will not give up an electron and it will not accept an electron because it is already complete in its shell. So this here, this semiconductor would be referred to as an intrinsic And, you know, when you think about intrinsic, you want to think about a pure semiconductor. So this would be an intrinsic or pure semiconductor because it is not going to, it is free from impurities. So that is what the pure comes from. It is free from impurities. The number of holes is equal to the number of free electrons within the semiconductor. But if we should just skip over to a workable semiconductor, and, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the types of, you know, intrinsic semiconductor. Pure semiconductor would be that of silicon or germanium. So silicon or germanium. So the, the SI unit for silicon would be um, SI. Germanium would be GE. Now silicon comes from silica, which is sand, while germanium is usually obtained from you know dust of zinc industries and so forth so the mere fact that you look at it you will realize that germanium will have a higher conductivity than that of silicon you know it will be it will have a higher conductivity in that in that of silicon now as was mentioned earlier though the conductivity of a pure intrinsic semiconductor it is too low for most purposes we can't work with it in practical you know areas so as a result of this now, we have to alter the structure. We have to change the structure to permit significant current flow. Now hence, we come up with the next term now, which is referred to as doping. Now what is doping? Well, if we just put it on our next sheet right here, doping, doping is the process of adding impurities, small amounts of impurities to that crystal lattice structure. So if we think about our crystal lattice structure that we had earlier, so if we think about our crystal lattice structure that we had earlier, doping is a processing that we're going to be adding small amount of impurities to it. But for those who are doing chemistry, you know, germanium, silicon would be referred to as a group four element because it has four electrons on its outer shell. Now, in order for us to do or add impurities, then we have to answer the question now as to where those impurities will be coming from. Where will those impurities come from? So, we, you know, the semiconductor germanium silicon is a group four element. And generally, you want to dope it with a group 3 element, which is going to be a neighboring element. So group 3, or you want to dope it with a group 5 element. All right? So group 3 element or a group 5 element. So that is what you want to dope it with, with a neighboring element. Now, if we should think about this, let us say, that we're going to be doping it with a group 5 element. So this would be a plus 4e, plus 4e, plus 4e, plus 4e. So all these are plus 4e. These are 
you know, pure semiconductors plus 4E plus 4E. So all these would have, you know, four electrons on its outer shell. But if we're going to be doping it with a group 5 element such as, you know, phosphorus, you know, phosphorus, which is going to be a, a plus 5E, then what we, we will result with is that we will have, you know, covalent bonds taking place, just as in the pure semiconductor. So covalent bonds taking place, and we know what covalent bonds are. You share electrons with a neighboring atom. So this would be covalent bonding taking place. But you notice right here, we have a plus 5e. E. So as a result of that, we're going to have what is called a free electron. This is now a free electron that is able to um, move about, wander about, so to speak. Free electron. Now, since we dope it with a group 5 element, and we now have attained a free electron, then the majority carriers would be electrons and the minority carriers would be holes because this would now be deprived of a hole so you know that would be this would be an example of an n-type semiconductor material because the majority carriers majority carriers would be electrons while the minority carrier would be holes. All right? Now, this will be classified as a donor. Why? Because it is able to give up an electron because it has a free electron. Now, if you look at a group three element now, if you look at doping with a group three, if you look at doping with a group 3, then we will still have our crystal lattice structure. We will still have our crystal lattice structure. But this time, we only have it being doped with a neighboring, which is a group 3. So, what will be the result? What will be the result? So because it is now a group 3, then the result, just like what we had before, you'll have covalent bonds taking place. So covalent bonds taking place. But because this is a plus 3e, then you notice it will, you would have a, 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 a hole that is right there. And uh, you know, that this would now result in this being a p-type semiconductor. And uh, in the p-type semiconductor, the hole, you have a free hole. So you have a free hole right here. So what will happen is that conduction will be able to take place because this electron which is negatively charged will be able to jump spaces because the hole is positively charged. And it is a P-hole, positively charged. And uh, you know that is what will happen right there. So the majority carriers for, for a, a P-type semiconductor would be, the majority carriers would be holes while the minority carriers the minority carriers would be electrons now this is the beauty about this subject you know the whole gentlemen ladies is always positively charged it's a p hole a positive hole now we have just outlined how you know we got our p type semiconductor as well as our n type semiconductor now we want to look a little bit now as to how we can actually work with this because if we look back on our n-type so our n-type we have a free electron 
So the majority carries will be electrons while the minority carries will be holes. And if you look at the p-type, then uh, the majority carries will be holes and the minority carriers will be electrons. Now, how can we go about, you know, making this become workable? Now, first and foremost, is that in order for us to let it become workable, we need to now create what is called a PN junction. PN junction. So, having a PN junction, that is what we will now term as a diode. So, once we put a P together and an N together, then that is what we get when we put when we get a diode so these are examples of diodes so these are simply a pn junction that we would have created so if we look at our diode we would have our anode and we would have our cathode so this would be our anode this would be our cathode all right so our anode and our cathode. So A, and then this is represented by K. So this here would be the symbol for our diode. Now this here that we have right here, these are examples of LEDs. So LEDs, light emitting diodes. And then this is just a regular diode with our P and junction. Now we have other types of diodes. We have our Zener diode. And you know the beauty about our Zener diode is that they can withstand a relatively large reverse current without being damaged. So that is what we call a Zener diode. Now a diode though is that we allow current to flow in one direction. That is the beauty about diode. It allows current to flow in one direction. Current flows in one direction. So it allows current to flow in one direction and the current will now be blocked in the other direction. So it allows current to pass in one direction and then it blocks the current in the other direction. Now the Zener diode though is a little unique diode because if you look at the Zener diode, the Zener diode will allow a relatively large reverse current without being damaged. Now, if we look at the LEDs and we should compare them with that Zener diode or even this regular diode here, we should compare it to the regular um, a, a Zener diode. If we look right here, all right, so let us see if we can get a little bit better image on this. So you notice that it has a little strip right here, all right. So the current will be able to flow in this direction, but if the current is coming in this direction, it is going to be blocking the current. If the current is trying to come in this direction, then it will block the current, but it will allow current to flow in this direction. Now, if the reverse current is too high, then let us say, for example, this will allow current to pass in this direction to five amperes. So five amperes can pass in this direction, but it will have a reverse you know blocking current of it can block up to say six amperes in this direction now if anything above six amperes come then it is going to damage the diode so it is going to burn up the diode and then you know it have to replace the diode but the beauty about this now is that a zener diode and uh, this is what we have right here this is a symbol for a zener so the zener diode so this would be the zener diode the zener diode let us use the same principle. Five amperes will flow in this direction, and let us say that it will block six amperes. Now, the beauty about the Zener diode is that it will block up to the six amperes, but if, should, if anything above six amperes come, it will allow it to pass. So it will protect itself. It will allow it to pass, burn up, whatever it will burn up, and then you know, when the circuit is turned off, then it will reset. So that is the beauty about the Zener diode that we have right here. Now, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be talking a little bit though about how we get our diodes to work so we're going to be talking about you know biasing now when we hear the term biasing then we think about favoritism now biasing we have two types of bias we have what is called forward bias and we have what is called reverse reverse um, bias so we have forward bias 
and we have reverse bias. Now forward bias is that you bias the diode in such a way that you allow current to flow. Reverse bias is that you try to block the current from flowing. So that is what will be happening right here. Now, before we talk about biasing though, let us see if we can focus a little bit more on the PN junction. The PN junction of a diode. Let us see if we can focus a little bit more on the PN junction of a diode. Now we want to look first on an unbiased junction. An unbiased junction. Now we know that when you put a P and you put an N together, then what will happen? For the P type, you will have majority carriers being holes. Majority carriers being holes for the P type. For the N type, you're going to have majority carriers being electrons. So let us use those to represent electrons. Majority carriers being electrons. Now, this is referred to as an unbiased junction. This is space charging. Now, what will happen is that we will have right here at the, 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 the PN junction. So that will be referred to as a PN junction. So what will be happening right across the PN junction? Well, over here, we have positive holes, P holes. Now, one thing we know, because we have positive holes, the majority carriers are going to be you know, holes, yes, so they, 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 we have positive charges. Now over here we have negative charges. So these positive charges are going to be attracted to the negative charges over here. So that's the reason why you will have, you know, the, 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 the charges jumping across the PN junction, so to speak. Now the same will also be here, because we have negative charges over here, so they will be attracted, you know, to these positive charges over here. So as a result, you know, the PN junction is unbiased and you have a widening of the junction, so to speak. But in order for us to forward bias this junction, so if we just look at this forward bias in the junction, we want to get current to actually flow across this junction. So we still have our scenario here. We have our P and we have our N. So we have our PN. So what is going to happen right here? Alright, so in order for us to get a forward bias in, so this is the N, this is the P, then we need what? A little battery, a little battery. So we know that this is a positive terminal of the battery, this is a negative terminal of the battery. Now we're going to connect the negative terminal of the battery to the N, we're going to connect the positive terminal of the battery to the P. So as a result of this, you know, Positive charges are not attracted to positive charges. Negative charges are not attracted to negative charges. So if we look at this, you know, these negative charges here, you know, think about a battery. So the battery is going to be increasing, you know, the number of negative charges here, you know, so to speak. So this room would be getting crowded. You know, this room will be getting crowded. But if you should look at it with this room being getting crowded, then it is going to cause a narrowing of the depletion region. So the junction right here, you know, the depletion region around it will narrow. So if you should look at the space charge, if you look at the unbiased junction, you realize that there was a widening of the depletion region. But here, the depletion region will narrow. So it will get narrow so much, it will narrow, you know, so much that, you know, these electrons will be able to jump across. So when these electrons jump across, you know, the PN junction, then, you know, the movement of electron is what current is. So they jump across because there are some P holes over here. But when you think about it, this electron jump across and fill this hole, so to speak. But this electron now will sense an even greater pull, which is this positive, you know, this, this positive terminal right here. So it is going to cause now this electron to jump across and then now you will have, you know, current flowing. And then now that is what forward passing would refer to. 
you know, you connect it in such a way that current will flow. How to achieve forward biasing? You will have your negative terminal being connected to your N type and your positive terminal being connected to your P type. Now, one thing that we didn't mention from our discussion is that to achieve forward biasing, you will need, you know, at least if it is silicon, you need at least 0 0.6 volts to break down or narrow this barrier. And if it is germanium, then you need at least 0 0.3 volts to narrow that barrier for conduction to take place. So if this battery is like around 2 volts, then certainly you would have, if this is silicon, you will have 0 0.6 volts dropping across the junction. So that will satisfy the junction. And then you, know, you still have at least another 1.4 volts now to force conduction taking place. So this would be for forward biasing. Now for reverse biasing, we want to look at a similar you know, situation. So for reverse biasing, you know, we are going to have a wider depletion region, so to speak. So this would be P, this would be N. So we would have, you know, So let us put the N over here. Yes. So this is what would happen with um, the, 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 the reverse biasing. All right. So this is what will be taking place in reverse biasing. So this will be the N type. So this here will be our junction. But you realize that the depletion region, the depletion region refers to the area around the junction it widens now what causes it to widen well we have a battery right here but you notice this time the negative end of the battery is connected to the um the, the p type which is the majority carriers being holes so you know that these holes will be attracted to the p the, the, the negative terminal of the battery rather and then you know these electrons will be attracted to the positive terminal of the battery so you have basically the holes moving in that direction, the electrons moving in that direction. So as a result, you widen the depletion region here. No current, you know, will be passing across that junction that is right there. So this is what we refer to as unbiased junction, forward bias junction, and or reverse bias junction. So we're going to be leaving it at this one now, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the next time we're going to be doing a video on this topic is that we're going to be looking at transistors. Yes, so we have our transistors right here. So we're going to be looking at transistors. And of course, you know, transistors is when you put, you know, a P, a N, and a P together, or you put a N, P, N together. Now, these are referred to as BJTs, bipolar junction transistors. But I want you to pay attention now because you have other types of transistors. You have MOSFETs, you have JFETs, you know, you have SCRs. So I want you to look up these, you know, for your next class because we're going to be going through these and we're going to be focusing now on transistor calculation. All right. So this is just a recap of our topic semiconductors.